We're excited to start our new series, and we'll be here for several weeks, all the way up to Christmas, like 16 weeks in 1 Timothy. And so fighting the good fight of faith is what we've entitled this series, Fight the Good Fight, and there is a good fight that needs to be fought. You know, when I was a, a young guy, I, I boxed for 10 years, loved the sport, loved the individual uh, competition of the sport. My dad coached me, and, and, I, and I may have shared this with you before on a Sunday night, but there was this one kid on our team that, man, I just, I just couldn't beat him. And so we were at the same age, same weight class, and, and I remember he was on our team, and my dad would put us together to spar together and, 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 uh, and box together, and, and I would come to the, to the corner, and I would just look at him and go, I don't know what to do. And he would say, hey, try this, try this. And, man, we just kept working on it. And, I mean, I just kept coming back and coming back to the corner going, I just I can't, I can't get it done. I don't know what's going on. And he just said, you just keep going. You just keep going. You just keep trying this. Keep trying that. So it came to the point, though, at one point where, man, I, I, I wore that guy out. And he never had another chance. And, you know, sometimes we need encouragement in our lives, right? Someone that's in our corner constantly encouraging us, constantly going, hey, try this out. Hey, I know that wasn't all we expected. I know that that wasn't what you expected or was going to happen, but let's just keep getting with it. We need encouragement. And I know this. I know that, that I need that in my life. I know that you need that in our, in our lives and that the church needs encouragement sometimes. And so when we, when we look at this letter that, that Paul wrote to Timothy, there's, there's a lot of encouragement for a young man there. And we're talking about a young man who's 20 years old, pastoring a church. For the very first time. And not only is he pastoring a church, he's pastoring a church that's got some very serious problems. I don't know if you knew this or not, but church people have problems. Alright, if you're here and you're, you're just trying church out and you think it's just a, a great, awesome place, and it is, we are not without our problems. There are always going to be difficulties. There's always going to be hurts and pains that, that are experienced within church because we're sinful people. We're redeemed people. We love the Lord Jesus, but man, we, we're, we're at times aren't going to be all that God desires for us to be. There's going to be problems. There's going to be hurts. There's going to be discouragements. There's going to be disputes. And so when, when Paul writes to Timothy, he's, he's helping him understand, Timothy, I know that I left you in a place that's going to be really difficult, really hard, but I'm going to give you some sound advice. And this is what 1 Timothy is for us, for the church, that here are, here are some incredible things that you need to know about how the church ought to operate, how the church ought to handle discipline issues, how the church ought to handle those hurts and those discouragements and those difficulties that come along with doing life together. Now, a lot of us think that it just ought to be perfect, it ought to be all harmonious, and sometimes it is, but sometimes we go through hard times. If you're going to truly live in biblical community, listen to me, biblical community is messy. It's not, it's not always a fun thing because we're bumping into each other. We're rubbing shoulders with each other. We're, we're really getting to know each other. It's like those couples that hardly ever, you know, that, um, that don't date very long, right? And there's nothing wrong with not dating long and then getting married. But all of a sudden, you're living with this person 24-7, right, all the time. And you're going, wow, I didn't think I knew that about them. I'm not sure I like that habit of theirs. I'm not sure I like how he just almost makes it into the basket with the dirty clothes. I mean, that's, that's kind of stuff that happens sometimes, especially even in biblical communities. We just get to know each other. Sometimes we're going to feel irritated by someone else. And you know what I said last week, right? That that irritation says far more about me than it ever will about the person I think who's irritating me, Right? So we, we find ourselves just looking at this passage, and if you had your pastor's note, you've got a quote from one of my favorite movies in here, from J.R.R. Tolkien, one of his famous lines from the Lord of the Ring movies, love those movies, where Sam says this, there is some good in the world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Right, there, and, I, and I would say this, that there, the church 
is worth fighting for. Not because we happen to be a part of it, but because Christ gave his life for it. He shed his blood for it. And he's coming back for his bride. He's coming back for the church. And the church is worth fighting for. Because it's good. And it's God's purpose and God's hope in redeeming the world through the church. It's his mission plan. So yeah, it's, it's worth fighting for. But man, don't we like it when we have that, that mentor or that, that person in our life that just encourages us? I mean, just, just at the right moment when we, when we need that encouragement, just at the right moment when we need someone to step in and just say the right things, to say the right words, and man, they're just there, that God provides that mentor, God provides that good friend, and they speak that truth, and they speak that encouragement in our lives, and we just go, oh man, that's so, so good. Like, I texted one of my friends today. Now, you have to put this in context. He used to be one of my youth workers in my church who's now was a youth pastor, and now he's a church planner. His church in the, has been around for about five years now. They've planted five churches. And this is one of the guys that I got to disciple, right? And so I, I knew they were getting ready to go on a trip to Managua on a mission trip, and so I just texted him and said, Hey, your brother Rufus, this is me, is praying for you today. Now, when he gets a call from Rufus, it's a little different than what you hear from me. And I don't know if you want to hear the Rufus voice or not. <laughs> ha! Well, <laughs> this is Brother Rufus calling you. <laughs> I just want you to know I'm praying for you, brother. <laughs> we have that special relationship, okay? I know you probably didn't need that or want that, but when he says this is from Rufus, he hears it in that voice, Okay? And so I, I texted him this morning and said, hey, I just want you to know Brother Rufus is praying for you, and I'm praying in that voice. And he's like, man, we're just getting ready to get on the airport to leave for this mission trip. Thank you so much. That encouraged my heart so much. Just those little moments that God goes, hey, why don't you just pick up your phone and text him right now? And we need that encouragement, right? And this is what the book of Timothy is. He's, he's looking at Timothy and going, look, Timothy, Fight the good fight. And, and my hope is that as believers, that we, regardless of what difficulty we experience as a church, as God's people together, as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would lock arms together and go, listen, we're going to fight the good fight of faith that we're not going to give up, that we're not going to leave mad, that we're going to hang in there and we're going to fight for the church because it's worth fighting for. That that would be our heartbeat. So I just want to invite you to pray with me this morning as we just look at two verses this morning in 1 Timothy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just ask that you would come into this place, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would open up our minds and, and, and the deepest part of our souls just to hear your words today, that they would be an encouragement to us to fight the good fight of faith. God, that your word might challenge us today, that your word might transform us today, that God, that you would change us because, Lord, we're in such desperate need of your Spirit to come and change us, to make us different, to make us look like you, to make us look like your church is supposed to look. God, we can't do that apart from you. So, Lord, we just ask that you would come and that you would change us through your word. May you be honored in the hearing and the preaching and the reading of your word this morning that you might be glorified. So God, come in our midst this morning and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So when we look at these two, first two verses, that's all we're going to look at today. That has no bearing on how long I preach today, just so you know. I know some of you are like, oh, two verses. Wow. Mm. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. May God bless the hearing and the reading of his word this morning. So let's talk about Paul just for a little bit, okay? Because it's good for us if we're going to start a series and look at and try to unpack these texts. And we're going to do everything we can to go verse by verse as much as we can through 1 Timothy. So when you think about Paul and you read about Paul and you study about Paul was a small stature of a man. <laughs> he had no particular marked appearance, meaning he wasn't a good looking guy. He might have been hit by the ugly stick a few times. <laughs> he had a common, low estate about himself. Now you put this in context of the Roman, the Roman time, the great Greek Roman times, and, and how much they love the body. I mean, that's why you see all these statues of these muscular men. I mean, they were all about being athletic, all about having this strong, masculine stature about them. And even the people of Israel struggled with that because the king that they picked was Saul, right? Who was head and shoulders above everybody. He was a massive man. He was a good-looking man. And they were like, yeah, that's the kind of king that we want. But you know, God uses the small, insignificant things of this world to confound the wise. And so this is, this is who Paul is. Nothing about his appearance would go, that's the man I want to follow. That's the man that God's going to do great things through. But he was a man uniquely used by God in the history of redemption. A man, literally, who stands spiritually head and shoulders above everybody else he writes most of the new testament for us and he's written this letter he's written this epistle to pastor timothy and so who's timothy timothy was a man who had a great mother and a great grandmother if you remember back on mother's day this is one of the passages that we looked at with second timothy that his mom and his grandmother were great women of faith and that they had imparted the truth to him early as a child, that he grew up understanding who Jesus was, but he also had a Greek dad, a pagan father who was not spiritual, who was not a believer at all. And yet Timi Timothy grew in the Word of God, that he was, as a young man, knowing the Scriptures and understanding the Scriptures. And he had spent several years with Paul. Starting at the age of 14, he left home to follow Paul. To be Paul's disciple. To do ministry with Paul. And listen, when you look at Paul's ministry, that wasn't a cakewalk. Paul was beaten and imprisoned over and over and over again, he was persecuted everywhere he went, and Timothy was right there by his side. Learning, being taught, being discipled. So what is this letter that Paul's writing is all about? So if you look at 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 14, he basically tells Timothy this, Timothy, I know that the place that I left you is really difficult. I know the place where I dropped you off and said, hey, I'm going to leave you here to pastor this church. I know there's all kinds of problems. But Timothy, stay the course. Stay there. Stay there working. Stay there praying. Stay there preaching, proclaiming the world. Timothy, Timothy, stay the course. Don't veer off. And then if you look at 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 through 12, he says this. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, in verse 12, which is key to this whole book, fight the good fight of faith. 
take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That Timothy, that you would stay the course. Timothy, that you would fight the good fight of faith. And that God's word would say the same thing to you and I. That he would look at us, that we can look at these scriptures and go, God, would you encourage us to stay the course? That you would encourage us to fight the good fight of faith. That we would hang in there. That we wouldn't give up. That we would understand that there is, there is something that's good worth fighting for. And that the church is that thing that is good and worth fighting for. That we would hang in there. That we wouldn't give up. Matthew 10, 34 says this. that Jesus says, I've, I've come not to bring peace, but I've come to bring a sword. And he says, and that sword, that, that sword's going to separate a man from his wife and a wife from her husband and a man from his family and from his children, meaning because of your confession, because of your commitment to me, because of your commitment to follow me, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that people are going to hate you. That the world is going to hate you. And that the enemy of the church, Satan himself, will persecute you. That he will come after you. That he will try to entangle you and ensnare you with bad doctrine and apathy. Two great enemies of the church is bad doctrine, not knowing the scriptures, not knowing who Christ is, and apathy. Both of them leave us inadequate for the task of what God's called us to. And so we are in a warfare. We are in a spiritual battle as God's people, as His church. There is a fight that's going on, whether you're engaging in it or not because of apathy or because you don't understand the Scriptures. There is a spiritual warfare that's going on. And there's one that's going on for your very life. For the very life of your neighbor, for the very life of your co-workers, for the very life of those of you who play sports, your teammates. There is a fight going on for the hearts and the souls of people. And that God's commanded us, that God's called us to engage as his people to fight the good fight. The good fight of faith. Because faith is worth fighting for. No, I don't know what you're fighting for in life. I don't know if you're fighting for a great career or great money. <laughs> you might be fighting for your marriage, and that's a good thing to fight for. I encourage you to continue to go at it. Listen to me. If you're not loving Jesus, you can't be loving your spouse. It's not possible. If you're dating someone thinking at some point they're going to come around, listen to me, if he or she's not loving Jesus, it's not possible for them to be loving you. So you might as well move on. That we are engaged in the spiritual fight, the spiritual warfare. And here's the thing. That we can engage in the good fight of faith with confidence because of who God is and what He's done for us. Do you hear that? That we can engage in this good fight with absolute confidence because of who God is and what He's done for us. Let's look at these verses. 1 Timothy. Paul, who we've talked about, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. An apostle of Christ Jesus. Listen. Listen. Paul's different from you and I. Paul aligns himself with the other apostles who spent three years being taught by Jesus, being discipled by Jesus, by, by seeing him. Everywhere else in the, in the Bible, most of the time when you hear them address Jesus as Lord, it's Jesus Christ. All the apostles ask in Jesus Christ. When Paul talks about it, he talks about Christ Jesus. And I think there's a reason for that. Peter's experience with Jesus was after his resurrection, after his glorified body, that he saw him first as Christ, not Jesus in the flesh, right? Before the glorified body. 
So all the apostles before, yes, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Paul's like, no, 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 Christ Jesus, that's how I was introduced to him. On the road of Damascus, when he knocked me off of my horse, when he blinded me, when I was going to persecute the church, and Jesus is the one who taught me. I wasn't taught by men. No one else has taught me anything. I was taught by Jesus himself. How encouraging to Timothy. To Timothy, I haven't learned from other men. I've learned from Jesus himself. Then I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus. Because even in the Testaments, we can, we can see other people talk about they're an apostle of the church. They weren't taught by Jesus. They were taught by the other apostles. And so there is, there is something unique and distinguishing about being an apostle of Jesus Christ. And there were special anointing that those men had. There were special powers to heal that God had given them. Special revelation into God's word that he had given them. Special commands that he had given them as apostles of Christ Jesus. And Paul saying, listen, Timothy... It's not that Timothy didn't know this. He's encouraging him. Listen, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God. Listen, an apostle is one who is sent. Someone who goes on mission, bearing the credentials of the one who sent him. That's what it means to be an apostle. Now, you and I aren't apostles, all right, but we're ambassadors. That God's called us to be his ambassadors, to represent him, to take his message. And you and I can have confidence in knowing that. And he says this. By the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, our hope. Listen, our confidence is in God's command. This is a strong word. This, this word commandment means a royal commandment, meaning it's not open for discussion. It's not negotiable. It's not, it's not by the will of God or the promise of God, but by the commandment of God. If you listen and read any other things that Paul writes, he's typically writing in according to the will of God, in according to the will of God. In this one, it's different. He changes it up and says, this is a command from God our Savior, and our Christ, our hope. There's some weight that comes with this letter that's different from the other ones. That Paul says, listen, Timothy, I am encouraging, and what I'm encouraging, this is a direct message from God. This is a command from God, and that you and I can take confidence in God's command, that we can engage in this good fight. God's commandment gives us confidence because we can be his ambassadors and we take his message we've given by his authority, not our own. And our confidence also is in God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, our hope. Listen, there's a lot of false teaching that Timothy was having to deal with. One of those was about the deity of Christ. That God was in the flesh, that Jesus was fully God, fully man. And Paul, right here, is tying it together. The commandment of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, our hope. He's linking them together. That they're one and the same. That there is one God. Now, the other thing that a lot of liberal theologians like to talk about is how the God of the Old Testament is the God of anger, right? And sometimes when we read it, we even feel that way. Like, like, man, it's just, there's so much wrath, there's so much death, there's so much anger. And that somehow, that somehow that's the God of the Old Testament. He's the angry God. And that Jesus is somehow that nicer God of the Bible. And so you have that Old Testament thought that here's, here's the angry God and that Jesus is, is the God that comes to appease the angry God. Listen, that's not the truth. That God is our Savior. When you think about some of the Old Testament passages that we've looked at together, when you look at Exodus 34, when God's revealing himself to Moses, and he says, I'll tell you what I'm like. You want to see my glory? In the midst of seeing my glory, I'm going to communicate to you who I am. I am a God who's what? Who is loving, who is kind, who's gracious, who's merciful, who's willing to forgive sin. Doesn't sound like an angry God, does it? 
Look at Psalms 25. Verse 5. Psalmist says, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait all the day long. Psalms 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fill? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He's my salvation. Verse 9 of chapter 27. Hide not your face from me, turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not, forsake me not, O oh, God of my salvation. You can see that same thing in Habakkuk, the third chapter, verse 18. But listen to me. It is God who is the master planner of salvation. It was from His plan from the beginning that He is God our Savior. And that gives us confidence that God has in His sovereignty planned out salvation. Paul is simply saying that salvation began with God and it was brought through through Jesus our hope. So God our Savior is past tense. Christ our hope is future tense. This is what Philippians 3.20 tells us, that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, right? That Christ Jesus is our hope. That we, because this is not our home, that our, our citizenship is not here, that our citizenship is in heaven, that our home is in heaven, and that we are awaiting Christ Jesus, our hope, that we are awaiting His return to bring us home. What an incredible encouragement this must be to Timothy. That God designed the plan and that Jesus brought it to pass. That He is our hope. The salvation that God planned, He designed is realized in Christ Jesus through His death and through His resurrection. God is a loving God who saves us. God is our Savior. And He accomplished that through Jesus Christ. This commandment is coming. Listen, this commandment to Timothy is coming from God, our loving Savior. In Christ Jesus, our hope. That that's who's encouraging you and me to fight the good fight. I want that kind of encouragement. Right? When things get hard, when things get difficult, when things get messy in, this, in, in, in biblical community and I feel hurt or wounded, I, I need to know the fight, the good fight. And I need to know that this command comes from my loving God who is my Savior and comes from Christ Jesus who is my hope. That's what Colossians 1, 26 and 27 tells us that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Do you get that? How many of you read that in reading plan this past week? That ain't enough, y'all. You hearing me? Colossians 1, oh my goodness. There's so much truth, there's so much theology there. And Josh and I were able to read that this morning on, on Friday, or was it Saturday? I forget which day it was. Saturday morning. Because that was our Colossians 1 reading plan it was for this Saturday. If you don't have one, we got them in the back. You can get them on our website. Get in God's Word. Be encouraged by God our Savior and Christ our hope in His Word that we understand that Christ in us is the hope of glory. That apart from Christ being in me, there is no hope. 
And he says, this is the mystery of God. This is the mystery of the gospel that somehow you and I, who are Gentiles, who are pagan, who were not close to God, who were not his chosen people, that now the living God lives in us. Oh my. Please, if you haven't read Colossians 1, go read it this afternoon. It's incredible. Listen to me. (laughs) Greater is He that is in us than that is in the world. Right? That Christ Jesus in us gives us great hope to know that whatever sin I'm dealing with, that God's greater than it. Whatever difficulty I'm going through in life, God's greater than that. Whatever hurt, whatever habit, habit I have, whatever, whatever hang up I have, God is greater than that. Whatever the enemy might bring to the church, God is greater because God lives in us. He's greater than our sin. That's what makes that song that we sang so beautiful this morning. God's grace. Grace, grace greater than all my sin not just one of my sins but all of my sin and all the sin that i will commit that his grace is greater (laughs) that's good news some of you need to wake up that is good news that grace is greater than all my sin listen i have been singing that all week long in my car, every time I'm driving to work, every time I'm going to home. Now, it's a terrible thing. I'm glad I'm the only one that's in the car. (laughs) People who are driving by me must think I've lost my mind. But I can't, I've just been overwhelmed by this idea and this truth that His grace is greater than all of my sin. And it's because Christ lives in me. Oh. Man, would you be willing to fight the good fight of faith? That you would step in and go, yeah, I'm I'm in. I'm going to fight this good fight. We got to get going. Timothy, my true child in the faith. Listen, this is a beautiful picture of discipleship. If you want to know more about discipleship, come back tonight because we're going to unpack this. All right? This is how I saved time this morning. You've got to come back for the rest of it tonight. This is an incredible picture of discipleship that Timothy, my true child in the faith. Now, Paul was not his biological father, but he was his spiritual father. That Paul had led him to Christ. Even though he had grown up knowing the Scriptures, understanding the Scriptures, when Paul showed up on the scene and began to preach the Word and to teach the Word, Timothy came to faith. And Paul began to disciple him. Oh, that you and I would understand that great call. That our purpose, the good fight for you and I, is that we would make disciples. That we would be able to at least have one man in our life, one lady in our life that we can look at and go, this is my true son of faith. That we could reproduce ourselves. That we, late in this life right now, that we could look and go, here are the men or the women that I've discipled in the faith. That I've won to Jesus. That I've poured my heart and my life into. And they're just like me. That's scary, right? But that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 16 and 17. He tells the people... Be like me. Do what I do. Imitate me. Because I'm imitating Christ. That we would be such people fighting the good fight of faith that we can look at anybody and say, yeah, you follow me. If you follow me, you'll follow Jesus because I'm following him. Amazing discipleship. Paul is saying here in this text, Timothy, you're just like me. Timothy, I have no one else 
like you. He's telling the church who's reading this, listen to me, you better listen to Timothy. He's just like me. Listen to me. Paul is the one who started the church at Ephesus. Several years earlier to this letter being written before he was in prison, Paul leaves his place of imprisonment, shows back up to this church that he started, that he poured his heart and soul into for three years so that all of Asia had heard the gospel. That's evangelism. And he comes and he finds out that it's racked with discipline issues, that it's racked with terrible doctrinal issues. And he says, I'm going to leave you, Timothy. Thanks, right? Wow, wow. Thank you, Paul. He says, he's my child of faith. That you're my child, my genuine child of faith. That's discipleship. You can learn more about that tonight. Sometimes it's good that we're reminded who we belong to, right? You get that? Because sometimes when we're in hard situations, that we're in difficult situations, that we're facing stuff like Timothy's facing, that he's got leaders in his church who aren't saved, he has leaders in his church who are teaching false doctrine, that he's reminded, hey, hey, You're his, you're here by his command, and you're my child of faith. You got this. It's good to be reminded who we are and who we belong to. Our confidence is in God's grace, his mercy, and his peace. Through Timothy, my true child of faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you get grace? Do you get mercy? Do you get peace? And typically when you read Paul's letter, he just says grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you. He adds mercy in here. He understands, man, I've I've got to encourage Timothy that God's people need to be encouraged with all of it. Grace and mercy. That grace is this, very simply. That you get what you don't deserve. Okay? You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You didn't do anything for it. You don't deserve it, but you get it anyway. That's grace. Undeserved, unmerited grace from God our Savior and our hope, Christ Jesus. That that's who this grace is coming from. This isn't just my grace, Timothy. This is grace from God, our Savior. Unmerited, unwarranted, but Paul knew that Timothy needed to understand that, listen, you have God's grace. That we, as we fight this good fight, must know that we can have confidence in God's grace. That we would understand, Ephesians 2, 8, that we're not saved by works, lest any man should boast but we're saved by grace. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're trying to accomplish. I don't know if you're trying to please God in your own strength and in your own flesh, but you cannot please God apart from having faith in Him. It's God's grace poured out on our hearts and lives that we cannot earn our salvation. And mercy is that you don't get what you deserve. Isn't that amazing? That God couples those things together with it for us? That I, I need mercy, that I don't need to get what's due me. That you and I both deserve death and punishment. And that yet God shows us his mercy. And that he punishes his son, Christ who is our hope. He punishes him instead of you and me. That he takes the penalty for our sin and shows us mercy by going and dying on a cross in your place and in my place, that we don't get what we deserve, that Christ got what you and I deserve. That is mercy. That I can put my confidence in. And that we need peace. Anybody need that? (laughs) Peace is the result of grace and mercy. It doesn't just mean harmony 
It means even in the midst of hard stuff, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of hurt and pain and, and discomfort and persecution, that there can be peace. Peace with God. Romans 5.1. That we have peace with God. That's the greatest peace that you need. And I know some of you are here this morning, you're thinking, man, I, I know, I need peace. Mm -mm. You, want, you want some tranquility in your life is what you want. But the greatest need that you and I have is that we would be at peace with God. And the only way that you can be at peace with God is that you come to understand His grace and His mercy. That you begin to understand just how wretched of a sinner you are. How desperately you're in need of God, our Savior. And how desperately you are in need of Christ Jesus, our hope. It's your greatest need. It's the only way that we can come to these tables this morning and even think about celebrating the Lord's Supper is because of His grace, because of His mercy, and because of the peace that God has made between us and Himself. Man, we're in, we're in such need of that encouragement today. With all that's going on in the world, that all that's going on in your life, that you're in need of God's grace, you're in need of His mercy, that you're in need of His peace. Listen, you don't just need grace for salvation. You need grace for every moment of your life. It's not possible you to love your wife, to love your children, and to honor God apart from God's grace being present in your day every single moment of your life. And everything that I know, even to stand here and preach, oh, I'm in desperate need of His grace for that. And I'm just not in need of mercy at salvation for my sins to be forgiven, for my sins to be wiped away. I'm in desperate need of God's mercy to continue to forgive me of the sin that I will do today and tomorrow. And I'm in desperate need of God's peace. And it only comes when I come and I surrender to the grace of God and the mercy of God do I begin to experience the peace of God. That regardless of what I go through, regardless of the circumstances I experience, that I know this, that God's got it all. That He's in control. And I can place my confidence in Him as God, my Savior, and Christ Jesus, my hope. That's where my confidence lies. And so when we think about fighting this fight, when we think about engaging in this warfare, that my confidence is not in me, my confidence is in anything, but God our Savior, Christ Jesus our hope, because of His grace, His mercy, and His peace. Amen? Amen. Man, that's our hope. Thank you, Lord. That's our hope. So this morning, we have the great privilege of coming to these tables. And remembering the hope that we have. To remember that Jesus showed us grace by giving us something that we don't deserve. And he showed us mercy by dying for our sins. And so when Jesus was with the disciples, he said, listen, I'm going to take this bread and I'm going to break it. I'm doing this for you. I'm going to break my body for you. So when you get together, you break this and you remember my sacrifice. You remember my mercy. And then he took the cup and he poured the drink. And he says, whenever you drink, you do this in remembrance of me. Because I'm going to shed my blood for you. Then I'm going to show you mercy. I'm going to take what you couldn't take. I'm going to take your sin away. He says, you do this in remembrance of me. And you remember how much grace God has shown you. You remember the peace that he brings because of what I accomplished on the cross. So this morning, as we get ready to prepare our hearts for this, I just want to encourage you. Listen, if you're here and you're not a believer, I say this with all love. I really, we love you. We're glad you're here. We want you to keep coming. We want you to keep learning. More than anything else, we want you to experience God's grace and His mercy and His peace. But if you don't know Him, if you've not surrendered to Him, you're not a child of His, these tables are not for you. 
And I say that because the Bible makes it very clear that if we partake of this in a wrong manner, we bring condemnation upon ourselves and that we could even cause death. And we don't want that for you. We love you. We want you to come to know him. We want you to come to a place where you receive Jesus and you understand what it means to come to these tables and to remember him. So this is for his children. Doesn't mean you have to be a member of this church as long as you're a faithful believer in Jesus. You're welcome to this table. But God also says that we ought to become in a manner that's worthy, that we're prepared. So you need to check your hearts, Lord. If there's any sin in me, if there's anything that I need to make right before I come to this table, Lord, you do that. You can do that sit in your seat. There may be someone in here in this church that you need to go over to and say, look, I'm sorry. I, I need to confess this to you. Make sure your heart's right before you come to this table, that you take it in a worthy manner as his children. And in coming and in partaking of this, that we're going, listen, and we're coming, Lord, we're ready to fight the good fight. We're ready to fight the good fight of faith. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. Lord, we thank you that you lovingly came and gave your life that you sacrificed yourself Lord that you poured out your blood that you bruised your body that you took our place on the cross that you took our punishment for our sin And God, that you showed us grace and you showed us mercy by sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for us. And Lord, because of his obedience when he died on the cross, because you raised him from the dead, you made it possible that we, your enemy, could be at peace with you through the forgiveness of sin, through the washing of your blood. And so God, we want to come and remember your son today. We want to remember that Christ Jesus is our hope. So, Lord, help us to honor you today in the way we partake of this bread and the way that we partake of this wine. We ask you to bless it. We ask that your body would be unified, that you would be glorified as we come together and meet you at this holy table. God, we need you in this process. We need your grace. We need your mercy. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse our hearts. Show us your mercy, show us your grace, and give us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.